concert with the class, but they're, uh, they are, and some of them are on, on their own freestanding events. Um, this is the uh, this is the first of those, uh, and there'll be uh, one next uh, in ten days uh, uh, on high speed rail, and we have two of the leading experts from outside of the U.S. coming in to talk about uh, lessons learned from projects around the world, um, and that'll take place on Thursday, uh, October eighteenth, next door at twenty three fifty five. Uh, that will be at twelve thirty p.m. Um, Today, uh, I'm extremely pleased to have uh, Hassan Akrata here to talk to us about Goods Movement Planning in Southern California. Uh, Mr. Akrata is the Executive Director of the Southern California Association of Governments, and he's been that since January of 2008. I believe that, um, that SCAG is the largest metropolitan planning association or organization in the country, uh, serving an enormous area with uh, a wide range of issues. He's been active in planning and public policy in Southern California for over a quarter of a century, mostly related to transportation, but, uh, but all aspects. Uh, prior to joining SCAG in 2004, he worked for the LA County Metropolitan Transportation Authority and the South Coast Air Quality Management District for stints of four years each. And he worked on transportation and air quality projects. He holds a master's degree in civil and industrial engineering from Zaporozhye University in the former Soviet Union. I had it down and I lost it. A master's degree in civil engineering from UCLA and is a PhD candidate in urban planning at USC. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Akrata to talk to us today about this movement in Southern California. Thank you. How do I move this up and down? Oh, uh, how do you think to it for me? <laughs> it is, so there's a variety of ways you can do it, but the, uh, the easiest is just right here. Well, we just the down there. Sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Taylor. Good afternoon to all of you. It's always good to be back here at UCLA. When I went here, was I graduated in 1986. It was a different campus. Um, it got much bigger and much better and had much younger people than I remember. <laughs> they get um, younger every year. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, Brian asked me to speak to you about goods movement, and I'm going to do just that. But before I do that, how many of you here do Sky? Oh, quite a bit. No, that's good. Uh, how many of you worked at Sky? I know you did. Those who didn't, you should. It's a, it's a good place to learn. I know I had the almost senior follow here, and I had three, one of them right there. Uh, who I actually have the pleasure of having. So if you're interested in working at Sky, uh, we do a lot with UCLA and USC uh, and others. But goods movement, uh, anybody an expert here in goods movement? All right. H how many of you have been to the port of Los Angeles Union Beach? How many of you were impressed by the size of those ports? Not many, right? <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk today uh, about actually give you some information about what it is, some kind of ideas. I, I, I will use this. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. We're, we're going to film it, and um, okay. and uh, we had the uh, we had the blinds down. And, oh, here it is. And it'll fit, it'll it'll show up better if, uh, if you don't have the right glare. But before I get into Goods movement. Uh, Brian told me that we are the nation's largest uh, metropolitan planning organization. Uh, we cover six counties, 191 cities, uh, over 18 million people, and uh, we are governed by a regional council. These are elected officials, 84 of them. Uh, these are the mayors, uh, supervisors, city council members of different cities. Uh, you see here in the map, we go all the way to Imperial. Uh, all Southern California except uh, San Diego. San Diego has its own Imperial. Uh, by uh, SCAG and all Imperial were created by United States uh, Congress statute. says we need planning organizations like ours to do short-term and long-term planning. Um, in the, after the Clean Air Act of 1991, the MPOs have to demonstrate that the regions are meeting the air quality uh, requirement and produce regional transportation plans uh, 20 years into the future. And uh, 
there's a lot of challenges when you talk about the future. Um, and, and one of them, not many elected officials really care what happened 20 years from now. Elected officials care what happened four years from now because that's when they're going to run again or two years from now. But 20 years from now, it's very difficult to get their attention. Uh, and, and that's a big challenge uh, for, for planning organizations. We're required by the federal law until 2008, only the federal law to develop a 20-year regional transportation plan. But in 2008, as a result of AB 32, how many here of the global warming AB 32? Um, there's a bill called SP 375, which is specific to transportation. Uh, the state bill, Senate Bill 375, require MPOs to actually include a land use element to reduce greenhouse gas emissions part of the regional transportation plan. So this last plan we just adopted in May was the first plan that contained a state requirement. So we're here to cover goods movement. Um, you know, when you take, remember this is the six county region, it's a big region, when you take the regional transportation plan for the next 20 years, it is a big plan. It's about half a trillion dollar plan. It's 500 billion with a B. And these are scary numbers, but actually, uh, these are real numbers. Uh, and, and about 400 billion of which is going to be collected through the existing federal uh, gas tax, state gas tax, local sales tax, etc. Out of this plan, a lot of money goes to maintaining the system, have a huge system. Um, the other $262 billion is going to go through capital investments in this region over the next 20 years. Out of the 262, almost $50 billion are designated for goods movement, the goods movement project. And that's a very significant number. And one would argue it should be really important for a region to to get 18% of its revenues in new capital to goods movement. And you're going to see why it is important in a second. You can see the other sectors there. Notice that the highway, we call it mixed flow, is about 6%. Uh, what does that mean to you? That means we're not going to be building a lot more freeways in this city. We're actually not going to build any a new freeway. We're going to maybe add a lane here, hopefully close the gap, uh, 7, 10, 6 mile or so, but not much freeway is happening. Uh, Ten of capital investments, goods movement has a significant share. When you talk about this region, uh, many other regions and many other countries envy this region. Not only because of the weather, we do have a wonderful weather, or because we have UCLA and a couple of other good universities, but because we do have six commercial airports, we have the largest U.S. container ports, that's Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's the largest in the U.S., the fourth largest in the world. Uh, we have probably the most extensive network of freeways. And any of you want to guess how many land miles of highways, streets we have in this region? Anybody? 67,000 land miles of highways in the city. And that's a lot uh, by any measure. We have two class railroads, PNSF and UP, and in three international crossings, mainly in the Imperial Valley in Mexico. So when you take these <coughs> uh, for a region like ours, they become a big assets for a region, and that's why goods movement is critical in this region. Uh, last year, the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, Port Monimi, you know where Port Monimi is? It's in Ventura County. It's a port where mostly cars, new cars come in. Uh, they collectively handled 336 billion of cars in 2009, one year. Uh, you know, we've we lately been talking as a nation of billions and trillions. These are big numbers. These are huge numbers. Most countries in the world, their budget is I born in a country in the Middle East, Jordan, their annual budget is $2 billion. So when you talk $336 billion in one year in three ports, that's a lot, a lot of money. Obviously, it is important for this region. 
goods movement is one of the most important sectors, probably after entertainment and manufacturing. And right now, one would argue that goods movement is more important than manufacturing because manufacturing is leaving at a faster pace. And if, if you're looking at creating jobs, uh, you need to make sure this sector is well served. Uh, this is just the contribution to the uh, gross national product, the regional one, 253 billion. And the employment contribution, and these are direct and indirect. It's not directly linked to the port, but it's indirect too. Uh, you could see that there's a lot of industry depending on goods movement. This is counting this job. So 2.9 million jobs out of 10, that's a big number too. Uh, so when, when you see uh, people talk about goods movement, especially for this region, is very important. As a matter of fact, uh, people are working in this sector on average make more than people who work in manufacturing in terms of a pay, uh, annual income is more. Uh, Right now, and we're going to talk about this, these little dots, these are warehousing. Uh, if you fly over Los Angeles, you look down, you see this flat roof. And uh, that's a lot of warehousing in this region, 837 million square feet, almost a billion square feet of warehousing. And this is one thing that not many regions in the US or in the world could, could have. And this is the usable ones. There is actually unusable square housing, I'm going to talk about in a second. But that amount of warehousing uh, and, and the amount of goods that come in and out of warehousing and, and the sorting and the distribution and the shipping, that creates a lot of economic activities that makes this sector very, very important uh, to the region. <coughs> Total occupied right now, as I said, 837 million undeveloped but suitable for development is 185. The demand, though, for what the ports are expecting to do by 2035 uh, is about 1.25 uh, billion square foot of house, for warehousing. So we're about 228 million square foot of warehousing short to accommodate the capacity forecast, not the demand forecast, but the capacity forecast. So. Uh, Imagine putting that, I mean, this is, this is a huge, this is big, uh, big number. Obviously, we do forecasts, and so do the ports. Uh, there is two kinds of forecasts. You could forecast based on your capacities, and you could forecast based on expected demand. And this is a big difference between the two. This is a, a capacity constraint forecast, meaning that if I were to put this graph for a demand forecast, you will see a much higher number. So by 2035, the number here is about 45 million, whether you're in 2007 or 9 forecast the same, about 42 million, 43 million annual containers. TEUs, they call them, 20-foot uh, equivalent of those big boxes, you see. That's what's expected in 2035. 43 million. Today, um, see the number there in 2012, we're about 14 million after the recession hit. The original forecast was much higher, but with the recession, we went down. And so th that's a lot of 20 foot equivalent uh, containers coming in and out of the port. And the reason I say there's a big difference between capacity and, and demand is this is actually constrained by the, the capacity of the ports to handle that much. Some, some forecasts, like the US does a, a national forecast, put the demand forecast at 60 million annual containers. Big differences between them. Now, obviously, there is a reason why uh, this is growing. One of it is uh, we're growing here as a region. As I said, our population in the six county region today is about uh, 18, uh, over 18, a little over 18 million people. We're going to grow by 4 million people. Brian used to say when he, he spoke to our board once, 
And at the time, he used to say, well, we're going to grow by that many. And he would say, this is one and a half the city of Chicago. And he would say, what are we going to do with all these Chicagoans when they get here? <laughs> well, we're going to give them some goods, you know, to, to, to the warehouse. But we're going to grow 1.7 million jobs and about 1.3 million households. Uh, and this forecast took into account uh, the slow, in, in the last census forecasts uh, slow. Actually, that number four used to be close to 4.8, 4.9. It was uh, revised downward. Uh, many of you drive the freeways. Uh, you see numbers there. The existing and the yellow is future. Some freeways is going to have about 55,000 trucks every day. Uh, some of them is going to pretty much cap in terms of capacity. Uh, it's unimaginable to think that they're going to be that many truck in many of these freeways. As a matter of fact, their practical capacity cannot be, uh, be that much. Um, the trades are grown too, both passenger and freight. You can see that the growth is tremendous. Uh, this is actually an actual picture down there of the 60 freeway. And we chose the 60 uh, for a reason I'll tell you in a second. But, but tremendous growth in both truck traffic and freight traffic. And you as planners is gonna, in, in your different fields later, you're gonna, you're gonna be asked, well, is it really worth it? I mean, we're investing in this sector. We want the, the trade to continue to come here. Um, but there's a huge cost. Uh, you know, there is pollution, there is emissions, uh, there is congestion, there is noise. And, you know, what price are we willing to pay to keep this economic activity going? Speaking of air quality, uh, you know we are the worst air quality region in the country when it comes to the national air standard. We're number one. It's good to be number one, the right? <laughs> but, um, and, and more and more, it's becoming difficult to comply with the Clean Air Act. The technology has saved uh, us for a long time. Technology advancement were the sole reason why uh, you're not old enough, but your, your parents and grandparents will tell you in the 1960s, you couldn't see the, see the mountains. You couldn't see much around because the air quality was so bad. So the air quality improved quite a bit. And it's mainly due to the improvement in technology, cars and trucks. But still, in this region, because of the amount of traffic, truck traffic and others, we're still not meeting the Clean Air Act standard. That red portion there, this red portion, is actually what we need to attain the federal standard of 107 uh, particles per billion. Uh, you've seen a lot of studies, uh, some of it from, uh, from uh, USC uh, regarding the health impact. There's a debate, of course. Some people think it's all bogus. Others think it's real. Uh, but you see numbers like 435,000 premature deaths due to bad air quality, and, and mainly due to diesel emissions. Whether you believe this number or not is not important, but you have to believe that there is an impact, especially if you live nearby either a source like the port or nearby a freeway that handles a lot of traffic. And that impact is definitely something uh, community uh, advocates and organizers are trying to highlight every time we talk about goods movement and expansion of goods movement, etc. The NAX is the biggest challenge in the sleep, hydrogen dioxide. And the mobile source is about 80% of the NAX problem, only 20% discretionary source. And in 2023, in a few years, uh, trucks will be 20% of the total NAX. So if we deal with the truck issue, we actually uh, will be able to meet the standards we talked about. Then there's the particulate matter 2.5. Uh, is a concern because the deadline is soon approaching. The federal deadline to meet the particulate matter PM 2.5. 
It's actually in 2014 and two years in 2019. In the lower hand side, you see here that for the port itself, the port you see the tracks is about 18%. You see that most of the pollution is coming from the ocean vessels. So, at the port itself, one would argue that if we deal with these mega ships, and you know, we'll be in good shape. But well, what do you think the biggest challenge in dealing with these ships' emissions? Even so, the technology is there, yeah. Uh, regulation, since they're in the water. Okay. Okay, that's a good point. International ordinance. International ordinance, because these, not even federal, these follow the international trade agreements. Okay. So if you want to have to do it, you have to change these agreements, you have to change the federal regulations. So regulating those is not as easy as, say, even the trucks, because of the, the Constitution of the Interstate Commerce of Texas for, for, for rail and for trucks, it's hard to regulate. You can't regulate it locally. It has to be through the federal government. In this vessel case, it's international agreements. And so, and if you look at the regional max emissions, goods movement is about 75%. So goods movement is the biggest contributor to nitrogen dioxide. And dealing with that is important. And one of the reasons you would see a lot of passion is when you talk about goods movement projects at the port is just that. And people say, well, you know, we're building infrastructure, uh, we're making it easy for trucks and rails to move around, and they need to mitigate the impacts. And the question, who's paying for the mitigation? If you're the railroad, you'll say, I'm paying more than my fair share. If you're the community, you're saying you're not paying enough. And that debate is going to continue for a long time. Uh, and, and I think, and I believe that at, at, at one point, we're going to be sick of going to court to fight each other. We're going to have to come to an agreement of how to deal with these, with these issues. Uh, there's definitely safety challenges when it comes to trucks movement. Uh, you see the color coded here, the 710, uh, the 60, and the 10 have some responsive challenges. How many of you uh, were here when we had the accident in the 60? This fire, the, okay. They closed the 60. Uh, this is actually right after the closure. They closed the 60 for three days. And uh, researchers and planners were busy trying to look at the impact of what that meant. And not only the 60 traffic was impacted, every single route was miserable. And we took an example. This is something we did in the 605. This is it, the green, almost free flow before. <coughs> Two days later, look at it. Yeah, this is a 605 going north and south. So the impact was hugely felt throughout Southern California. Uh, actually, I, I live in uh, San Bernardino County, and I happened to fly from San Francisco that day, and to get to my home took me four hours, taking 45 minutes normally. Uh, so now, after that, a discussion starts happening is, what happened, God forbid, if we close a couple of bridges? I mean, uh, you know, the Carmageddon, we advertise for it, and people get in for it, it's in the weekend. But what happens if unforeseen closure were to take place in a couple of bridges and couple of freeways? Would this economy <coughs> suffer? And, and the question is absolutely. And there's a debate right now in California uh, about the state of the bridges. Uh, there is right now about 2,100 state bridges in Southern California that were classified by Caltrans as either structurally deficient or obsolete. That doesn't mean, God forbid, they're going to fall tomorrow. But that means they're under-preserved and under-maintained that if that trend continues, some of them have to close. At a conference in uh, Orange County, uh, I don't remember the name of the gentleman, a national expert, talk about the national problem of bridge closures. But when you talk about 2,000 bridges in Southern California, that's a huge number. And if, God forbid, five or, or ten of them were to be closed, not only goes movement get impacted, everybody gets impacted. 
So the state of California did put the report right now that says state of California is about $296 billion under maintaining, under preserving the state system. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how do we pay for it. Obviously, the state is broke, and nobody wants to raise taxes. Politicians don't want to do that. Uh, therefore, closing a bridge is important, not only for goods movement, for passenger movement also. So, a lot has been made. We need to stay competitive with the rest of the world and the rest of the U.S. As a matter of fact, in Seattle, Tacoma, they have a, a major port. And they had an advertisement in the, in the airwaves, in television and radio, and the advertisement says, come here, we are free. Meaning that we have no fees to be charged like Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, and, and obviously, we <coughs> want to we compete with the U.S. port, we want to compete with the international ports to stay competitive because, as we said earlier, a lot of jobs depend on this movement. Uh, but there is definitely competition. Uh, there is the expansion of the Panama Canal. And uh, we're going to talk about what the impact and how the impact that could be. And the growth will trade in with Europe and Latin America will favor the East Coast. Um, there is other West Coast like Seattle, Tacoma. Uh, Canada uh, uh, is, is beginning to invest heavily in ports. Uh, and, and so it is to the advantage of this region and our elected officials, our uh, decision makers, aware of the fact that we need to compete and we need to build the infrastructure to make sure that we stay competitive. Now, you have to understand that people don't come here just because of the weather. They come here because we have almost 22 million people, if you include San Diego, that they need goods. So if you go to other ports, you still have to ship that goods to them. They come here because we are one of four ports in the world that have deep water, where mega ships could come. They come here because we almost have a billion square foot of warehousing, because it makes economic sense for them to come here. And the question is, when do we lose? At what point we're going to lose that competitive advantage of all of those things? And I'm going to talk about fees and who pays what uh, a little bit later. A study done by Professor Rob Leachman from Berkeley talk about the elasticity of charging the ports. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. But no question, we do have competition, and no question we need to keep, uh, keep competitive with other ports. This is an important part I want you to pay attention to because I'm going to go next to a graph that's going to there are different kinds of things that come to the ports. Right now, we about have 15 million containers every year come to the ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach. This 40% of it is actually comes in, gets in a rail, and leaves the region. That's called the inland point intermodal, IPI. And this is extremely sensitive to price. So if you start charging, say we're going to start charging every container $5 to pay for infrastructure, that kind of cargo can't go anywhere in the U.S. because it's not consumed locally. And there are some people with REU, I don't know how many of you know, know Norm King, who was the executive director of Sandbag. He used to argue that, as a matter of fact, we do everything and our power to get rid of that 41% because all we get is the bad emissions and from locomotives and all that headache and the infrastructure, etc. So he, in his view, we don't care about that. I don't think it's quite that, but that 41%, just keep that in mind. Then you get to the 36, this is, according to Norm King, called the bad freight. <coughs> then you have the 36%, he, he calls it the good freight. This is where things get from the ports, get either loaded, loaded in a truck, goes to the warehousing, gets sorted out, and some would get consumed locally, and others would be put on a train again and leave the country. That creates economic activity within the region. That's why he calls it good thing. That's the 36%. This one, less sensitive to price, but more sensitive to travel time. 
So providing infrastructure to make things go faster is important for the, the transloading as opposed to IPO. And of course, uh, there's 23% locally consumed, and, and that is uh, mostly moved by, uh, by tax. These are important distinction because when you say stay competitive, this is sensitive to price. We could lose that much easier with the Panama Canal, with the other West Coast. But that one is we don't want to lose first of all. And second of all, it's more sensitive to travel time. So keep that in mind, and we're going to get to a uh, chart. Uh, so the elasticity of imported sandwich reports to potential fees more sensitive than previously thought. Dr. Leachman did a study in 2004. He came back in 2006 and he said, wait a minute, I think we're more sensitive than thought because at that time we had that, the, the extra fee added to the trucks to move in the off-peak. Um, obviously, the elasticity <coughs> to potential fees is primarily a function of the prevailing rail and steamship rates. And 10% change in rates in the large importer makes share make big difference the market share. So here is the conclusion of his elasticity study. And I want to spend some time here. Right now, if you take all the fees that we charge at the port, whether truck, rail, uh, container fees, they're about $150 a container. And this is for the, this blue line is the total freight. So if I take $150, go up at 100%, that means right now we're having 100%, no competition, all is fine at $150. But the more, if I charge more, then that number, the percent goes down. That means I'm only capturing 80%, 70%, 40%, etc. But there is a big difference between the transloading, the things that get sorted in the warehousing, and the, the intermodal. Intermodal is very sensitive. If you compare the base case to case with relief, the transloading is sensitive more to travel time. So what, what this elasticity study says, it is elastic. You can't really go charging a lot more money and expect to keep people coming here to Southern California, even with all the wonderful thing we have. And what this also said, yes? I'm just trying to understand this graph. So mm -hmm. so you have two things going on. One is each of the lines as the, price, the, base. As the price goes up. Yeah. Uh, the, the so getting 100% <coughs> is wonderful. Like you get 100% of the trace. 100% is like we want to be here. Right. So you have, the, you have the congestion relief in the base case. Right. But you have the same price. I'm just wondering what the percentage. Well, you co you compare the con the congestion relief, the base with the with the congestion relief. So the congestion relief is, is a higher fee. Yes. Okay. On. See, but isn't the fee accounted on the on the x-axis? Yes, but it is. So say take we charge. Say we do two hundred dollars. Take the IPI. You compare that to this. So oh, you I see. see, compare the base case to the, so either 25% or? I see. Okay. And that, that's, by the way, a 500-page study we try to put in one chart. <laughs> uh, and if you want that study, it is on the website if you want the detail. But the point here is what this actually told us and what we told our elected official, uh, because there were proposals in California, uh, Senator Lowenthal put a bill to charge every container uh, another $60 or $76. And we're telling people, be careful, because you can't have it both ways. You can't maintain the trade here and keep charging. There is, a, there is an elasticity of charging. And a decision has to be made. If you don't care, for example, about the intermodal freight, uh, be it, that, because that's more sensitive to price. The transload is less sensitive, but you need to build the infrastructure to make sure trucks could get to the warehousing fast enough and there is no closures. So this is important because goods movement, it, for many people, oh, you know, we get goods, we get them in the stores. It's very complicated. 
you know, from the time you ship them from China or, or South Korea to the time you give them to the store is a very complicated process. And, and it is a process that people try still to understand. And, and Professor Leachman tried to say there is an elasticity that goes with that. This is what I was saying, 150 is 500, and then you start going from The more you do it, you compare the base case to the case with congestion relief. So we have a very clear goal and vision for, uh, for this region. We want to stay competitive, no question. We want to promote local <coughs> and job creation. We want to create the mobility for freight and passengers. We want to improve safety. And obviously, we want to mitigate envi environmental and community impacts. And the question is, can you do all of that? Can you have all of these goals and vision and meet them? You know, can you, can you, you mitigate the impact, keep competitive, increase safety, etc.? Can you do that? And that's a good question to ask and debate. I believe, yes, we can. And the reason I believe we can is because we have done quite a bit of improvement in terms of air quality in the last few decades. That will continue. But I believe what we're lacking right now is a major investment in infrastructure and a major source of funding to maintain the infrastructure we have. So the Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy we just did as we said earlier, has $48.4 billion in goods movement investments. Um, some of it is on the highways, and East West Corridor I'm going to talk about in a second. Some of it in increasing the capacity, and some of it in looking at intermodal facilities and at air quality measures. Here is a, a major investment in the highway. Uh, the 17 come from the port, meets the 60, the 60 goes east, meets the 15, and the 15 goes north toward Parsley. We are proposing two truck lanes each direction on the 17, the 60, and the 15. We started in the first segment. The 17, the environmental impact report is almost complete. And now we just finished the alternative analysis on the 60. I'm going to start the environmental impact report. Here's the significant things about this. One is, this is proposed to be a toll facility. So uh, a truck will use this facility for a fee. Now, does that mean that every truck has to use it? No. You still can use the, the mixed flow lane. But if you value time and you want to pay, you can use that facility. Number two, and more importantly, either zero or near zero emission can use this facility. No. A diesel truck can be on this facility to deal with the mitigation aspect. Yes? Is there an enforcement um, component to the corridor system? Does yes. Does it mean it can be, but is there going to be somebody, like a third party that's going to make sure that the trucks are going to zero emission? Yeah, two, two, that's good. Uh, right now, the technology exists where you could have transponders to be read by, uh, like you do in the Toros and Morris County. So obviously, a truck that are either zero or near zero will have that. If you don't have it, you can't go into the facility. It's easy to enforce it. The question is, who does enforce it? And oftentimes, these kind of things, like you did uh, with the toll road, you create joint power authorities. Uh, this, this truck system is in all three counties, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino. You have to create a joint power authority like you did with Metrolink. But the technology can do the rest. And you don't have to stop at the booth to pay tolls. It's all automated, like you do with transponder. But, but I guess the other question in terms of enforcement is only the federal government actually regulates trucks because they're interested in commerce. So the federal governments have to delegate that authority to the state and the state to the local GTA. And that happened before. It could happen. But this facility, the reason it is not going to have, um, only going to have zero and near zero emissions is because the communities that these trucks go to would stop it for sure uh, because, let me guess, go ahead. Well, go ahead and finish your sentence. Yeah. I was going to say, when we started the process of walking the East West Corridor, 
people were screaming, people were opposed to it, saying, well, why do I want you to have a facility where our kids and our people's going to be breathing this Nax visions? But when you tell them that, it's actually going to do the opposite. It's going to encourage trucks to clean and to be clean for them to use it. Uh, you get the communities more acceptable. Doesn't mean that they all agree, but at least it's more acceptable. Yeah, so it seems like there's two things going on. One is the long-term uh, effect would be to give a significant time advantage to cleaner vehicles, which would encourage people to shift to cleaner vehicles. On the other hand, the short-term effect would be that the cleanest vehicles would be moving uncongested and that diesel trucks would be stuck in traffic, producing more emissions per mile uh, as a result of, of this. So that it, it seems to me that you have actually think make things possibly to make them better in the long run you might make actually increase emissions that's a in the very, short run. That's a very good question. Said by a good professor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the short term first of all, they have a, a debate about whether the technology exists. That debate is over. I think the technology does exist. There's a demonstration now by Siemens and other that says you could actually use overhead carriers for trucks. And then, so the debate about the technology is no longer the, the dominant portion. So now, if the technology is there, people say, well, wait a minute. If you build either a highway zero or near zero, how are you going to get out, and I'm going to show you, to the warehouse? Because contrary to the belief that all these trucks on the 60 freeway are coming from the port, that's not true. As a matter of fact, the majority of them is locally generated. So how is these trucks is going to leave that facility where you could be electric and the technology exists where actually they could leave for five miles and still be okay in terms of, of charging capacity. So to Brian's point, our argument to that point is trucks better very quickly get to a situation where they put zero and near zero engine in because they have to meet the requirement. And if somebody is actually going to be very punctual about it, you could be soon in everything you do. And therefore, we, we expect that by 2020, most trucks have to meet that criteria regardless of whether we build this facility or not. Yes, sir. So, uh, as more trucks would convert over to zero emission, uh -huh. um, what would be your plan to deal with the additional congestion that would go into the truck lanes? You mean if, if there is more of them? Yeah. Uh, yeah well, First of all, you can never eliminate congestion. You have to. There's never enough lanes you're going to build to say. But we think that by doing this for trucks, especially, you know, this local 53-foot container that's much bigger than the 48, the, the argument is you're going to add capacity. And the capacity is not only by creating the lane, but actually by freeing capacity in the mixed flow. So you're adding capacity two different ways. Taking some trucks out, you're not going to take all trucks, there's not enough capacity to that. But taking some trucks out is going to add to the capacity and then mix flow. So at one point, yeah, you're going to get to a point where you're congested, but it's probably a long time before you get to that point. Yes? Is there, um, besides installing this additional electric charging infrastructure like the overhead wires, right. is there another way for a freight truck to become zero emission or low emission vehicle? There is actually the highway, they call it the highway alternative, where you actually could wire the highways with charging. So you could be driving on uh, uh, batteries in the highway. But, but, all, all, uh, but in order for trucks to reach that sort of low emission status, yeah. the, there needs to be a, a new technology on the facility. Yeah. Uh, so it, some, the government has to, you know, in this case SCAG or the port, it needs to install um, yeah, so we in, in order to get to that point, sure. it's not necessarily going to naturally occur. Sure, absolutely. And by the way, it's part of the cost of the facility is exactly that. The cost of either the overhead or the underhead, whatever it is, that's going to be part of the equation and that's going to be part of the fee charge. This is a, a very good example. I don't know whether you hear of the public-private. Uh, you have a class about that right here. Mm -hmm. Public-private partnerships. But, you know, you, you collect revenues, you could look at that. But that has to be part of the equation. And it doesn't mean that the government has uh, to pay for it. Somebody will pay for it. And government should be a partner in that. But that's part of the cost. Yes, sir. So would the same, I mean, would, it, would it, the, the truck be able to work the same from the top or the bottom or those two different technologies? Two different technologies. So would you have to get the same 
you know, standards, I guess, in different regions for the for that truck? That's a good question. So what happened to the truck after it left South in California? Normally, look, trucks go up to 500 miles. The, if you are over 500 miles, you have to put it on a train. So you could go to Arizona, you could bring you to Nevada. That's an easier thing when you talk about two, three states as opposed to 50 states. The reason this electrification was resisted by the railroad, still resisted until today, is that point. What happened when you reach the, the Southern California border, you have to assemble and deassemble, and this has to be a national program, all of that. The four trucks is a bit uh, different because trucks range is about 500 miles. Uh, you know, a couple of states have to work out certain things. But the good thing about this technology is you could ha they have the technology today, once you leave the region, you could operate in, in, in gasoline or diesel. Uh, you could do that. The technology, again, this was a big debate. Oh, this is still in trial. The technology is not there. The technology is here. The political will and the leadership is not there. The money is not here. But the technology is here. Yes. With this, this new technology for trucks, right. um, it seems to make sense for you know the, the efficiency. Um, what I wonder is, if that's available for trucks, is it going to make sense to push that for personal automobiles and then allow them onto the truck tollway if they have that same technology? Sure. Well, the truck facility is not supposed to have automobile. Be crazy if you want to drive with all these trucks then. But but would the technology be available for automobiles? Yes. The, the issue is the range of electric vehicles, still an issue. But, but uh, is uh, right now, you know, you have uh, companies producing electric vehicles. Uh, actually, some people are beginning to use it. It's not moving as fast as we thought initially for passenger vehicles. But I think in, the, in this decade, it's going to move faster given where the gasoline prices are and the debate about the emissions. So yes, it will be carried a different scale for passenger vehicles. But trucks, again, goods movement for this region uh, is taken center stage in terms of cleaning up the emission, because 80% of the max emission is port related. Just to clarify, you said one solution is that the, the trucks can be electric out to the California border, and then they can turn on sure. the engine and drive gas? Sure. And the good news is the technology right now is such that you could leave the 60 freeway, which is electric, for five miles in either way and still be charged and come back to the facility. That was a big issue before, is because a lot of trucks get in and out to go to the warehousing along the 60. You know, there's a lot of warehousing in the city of Indus, et cetera. So if you do that, the technology is there to allow you to do that. So I just wanted, is there, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that there is data on the percentage of um, independent owner-operated yeah. trucks? And then it's so talking again about this private and public mm -hmm. um, payment system. Then does the do the tolling then does that fee fall on the independent truck driver, which already we've seen it falls in carry every, a lot of weight? Every truck that uses the facility, regardless who operates. Every truck that uses this toll facility have to so pay. So the truck driver pays, not yeah, necessarily the yeah. shipping company or Walmart. Yeah, uh, whoever drives, I'm I'm sure. If you're an independent, it's you. If you work for a company, it's your company. But every truck that gets in that facility, the idea is you will pay a toll. And that toll would be determined by the cost recovery over a life cycle cost. Yes? I have a question, harking back to your, uh, you're talking about bridges. And right. You mentioned 2,000 bridges that were structurally deficient. I know that there's the, the federal rating system and national that's the Tory structural deficiency and the right. functionally obsolete, but it's, it's a poor indicator of failure, I've heard. Um, and you have a civil engineering background. I'm yeah. curious to hear what you have to say about do either SCAG or the cities have uh, the analytical tools to assess like where the risks of bridge failure are more likely so they can plan ahead for that? Sure. Um, here's, and that's a very good question. Uh, look, this is, shouldn't be a, a scare tactic for the public. You know, we could be very dramatic and put a sign in every bridge and say, this bridge is five years away from falling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't think anybody would do that. Plus or minus two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, do statistical, you know. <laughs> and, and being an engineer, I can relate exactly to uh, the definition of structurally deficient and obsolete. It doesn't mean God forbid they can afford. But they were designed to different standards. They were built in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, trust me, they were not designed for uh, a large-scale earthquake. 
and some of them has been under maintained so badly that actually uh, I would say uh, I think right now there's about eight or ten you could put a sign that says dangerous. Which one? one? <laughs> 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 you go ask somebody else. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I, I will not until you get your degree. <laughs> right. tell you. I can tell you this: that those those uh, those eight or ten from Mobility Twenty One campus specifically put where they are. And again, uh, don't think that regardless of how bad our elected officials are going to let you go on a, on a safe bridge. But they need attention, immediate attention. And, and Caltrans need to figure out the funding to make sure they're safe. So there's that. Out of the 2,000, I'll say there's eight or 10 need immediate attention. The 2,000, they need attention in the next five to 10 years. Otherwise, the 10 becomes 20 and 30 and 40. And that's really, if you ask me what's the biggest challenge for the state of California right now, is the system is getting older and What's the first thing that Caltran cuts when they cut budgets? Maintenance. Maintenance. It's not sexy enough. You don't cut the ribbon. Mm -hmm. but right now, if I go to uh, the voters in Southern California and say, guys, I want to charge you a, a half a cent sales tax to maintain the bridges and the roads, I don't think I'll get two thirds. But Major R passed in LA County, but it says the, the worst economy since the Depression. 70% why? Because they wanted to see this project. They wanted to see the subway to the sea. And they want so that is something culturally we have to deal with. And we have to get into the habit of calculating life cycle costs. You know, there is good uh, experiments from the world we could learn from. The modern Hong Kong and Singapore and Shanghai works because they figured out a, a way to get money from the land proceed to finance infrastructure forever. We, since to be in the habit of like to build because our elected officials like to cut ribbons, the maintenance is later. It's 20 years from now, not important for them. That's a big issue. That's probably the biggest issue for uh, in Southern California. So again, these bridges in California, they're not going to fall tomorrow, but they need attention, they need attention fast. So I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to go through uh, a couple more slides. So the, I told you about this is, this is an exciting opportunity. The, the most exciting is we started this, uh, I think Brian remember, in 1998. Mm -hmm. And it is a success story to be completing the environmental impact report in the first second. That's a, it doesn't happen that fast in the planning world. Uh, and so I'm proud of this. Uh, I, I think this is the fact that's going to be accelerate zero and near zero. The fact it's going to be a tall facility is a good thing. Uh, and, uh, and I think people are beginning to take this technology more seriously. Uh, a lot of bottlenecks for trucks. You know, I see the, those red dots don't drive there uh, during the peak because you have a lot of trucks. And you know, what do you think the percent of truck traffic from overall truck, uh, all traffic in Southern California? Give me a number. Five percent? Yeah. Yes, it is around 5%. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what do you think the capacity they take up? 25%. So you have 5% of the traffic, I mean, the truck counts, traffic counts, but 25% of the capacity. So imagine if you figure out a way to move this truck, you're adding 25% to your capacity. That's important to look at from an engineering standpoint. Uh, there is strategies, obviously, you could do great crossings, you could divert. The ports impose this fee that uh, encourages truck to drive in the off-peak at the night hours. Uh, you don't see many trucks on the night hour. Do you know why? Why don't the trucks just avoid all these fees, avoid all this congestion, and drive at night? Why do you think? Come on. It's not as safe, and they can't do it as quickly because of that. No, the safety is probably safe. I mean, the, the lighting is okay. Yeah. Labor costs? Because warehousing is not open at night. Mm -hmm. And why is warehousing not open? Because labor and unions don't want to open them at night. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. As one of we were talking over lunch with Brian, that if you look at our port complex in terms of technological advancement, we're way behind. People who come from China and South Korea, they laugh at us. And the reason is that the labor and union so if you open the warehousing, 
At night, you eliminate so much congestion for everybody, not just for the tracks. Well, we're not going to do it anytime soon. Maybe we will have leaders come and say, here what we're going to do. Uh, obviously, there is rail improvement packages. Uh, we're adding mainline capacity. We're doing greater crossings. Uh, and you know, the, the passenger rail uh, is, is suffering from the amount of freight. Because remember, Metrolink have to share the tracks with the railroads. That's a big challenge for expanding the commuter rail system. Uh, somehow something has to work. And I have to tell you, anybody with the railroads here? Good, so I'll be able to say this. <laughs> They're the most difficult people to deal with. <laughs> they think that the interstate, the Constitution gave them something, and they said, you know, sorry, this is the way it is. I mean, remember, it's this, all of this right away they supposedly own was given to them by the federal government. But when you talk about schedules and stuff, they're not, they're not very friendly, uh, especially when you talk about fees. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the strategy has great benefits. This is exciting in terms of the uh, thing we're doing with AQMD right now. <coughs> we applied for a grant from the Department of Energy to have a demonstration of zero and near zero emission on a small segment. And we can actually, between 2015 and 2020, do that for a on a small scale to see whether it works or not. These are the phases of that demonstration. And I hope in the future I'll come back and talk to you about the success. This is where I told you that contrary to the belief that every truck on the 17 and 60 is coming from the port, actually this tells you that origin destination, the green and red, that a lot of trucks are coming from the port go nearby to warehousing, go as far as the 60. But you don't see many going all the way east. There are some. So about 65% of the traffic, the port traffic, don't go all the way east. It stays around where the warehousing is. And that's even a bigger picture of where the warehousing is. This tells you <coughs> the elasticity study that uh, Professor Leachman did. This is interesting. One of his recommendations to avoid uh, and the, 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 the price going up is to build more warehousing close to the ports as opposed to going to the Inland Empire and build and have that added cost. Obviously, if you say that in front of our board, which has a lot of people from the Inland Empire, that's chop your head off. So <laughs> we, we, we like the warehousing there. But the, technically speaking, it is actually a lot of track traffic from the port is within the port area. And this is like when I talked about, you know, if you see the route of the truck lane 60, this is the pink area is actually trucks, if they're zero emission, they could leave the facility within five miles each way and still be charged. Okay, there's a, obviously the near term technology we talked about moving forward. And I'm going to conclude by this and we'll open it up for questions. And we have still more questions. I, I think goods movement is critical to this region, no question about it. I think this region should stay competitive, no question about it. I think we have a lot of things going for us in this region to stay competitive. What we don't have right now is a, a huge desire to build the right infrastructure to resolve this issue between passenger and freight rail to build that highway facility and to do it in such a way that it doesn't increase the price a lot for shippers to leave this region. Uh, obviously, community impact and emission impact is a huge. It's big. It's real. Uh, and one needs to deal with it. I believe you need to mitigate the impacts before you think about building facilities. I think there's a way to do this. And I think from um, an engineering standpoint, there is not much we couldn't do in this country if we took our mind to it. So in terms of the next steps is collaboratively working with all the stakeholders to make sure these solutions we talk about get to a win-win situation. With that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions. about the, um, the clean freight corridor, mm -hmm. you said that the, um, the question of whether or not the technology exists to mm -hmm. just settle, how long did that take that, that take to get resolved? 
the technologies exist, no question about it. How long did this technology become operational at this scale? Uh, you know, if you talk to the people who are inventing the technology, like Siemens, they'll tell you we're ready. Right. We're ready to uh, give us the funding and the resources. Actually, they do have a video, and I forgot to put it in here, demonstrations. Uh, with every technology, I don't think they're really ready for that scale, but they could be ready with some incentivizing. Uh, so uh, I think the debate was much more, 10 years ago, people say, ah, you know, the technology is not there. I don't think you hear that anymore. Yes, I saw it. Yes, sir. Uh, with the shipping corridor that's electrified, is there a greater risk for terrorism or sort of, you know, sure. big delays? Sure. There, there, is, there is all kind of risk when you put that many trucks in one facility. But that exists today. I mean, the 60 freeway uh, is about 35% truck traffic. Uh, obviously, you have to deal with the safety issues. Uh, but to be very honest with you, that, that's an issue for even passenger vehicles. When you have that many vehicles on the freeway, you have the 405, what, 375,000 cars a day. That's a lot of cars. It's an issue. Uh, but, you know, it's an issue that you have to deal with regardless whether you build the facility or not. Yes? Uh, as for the Alameda <coughs> corridor is project, is there any kind of program uh, on that project? Alameda corridor is, that's your question, right? Yes. Uh, no, right now there is, let me see if I can go back here, there is the Alameda corridor. How many of you have seen that, that trench? Just pull that drawer, it's, it's sort of flat. Oh, this one? Yeah. You find the one. Right now there is a, a corridor. It's a trench that really goes all the way from the port to downtown Los Angeles. That corridor, the planning for that started in 1979 with a planner named Gil Hicks. He was working at SCAG at the time. There was an idea of a planner who just out of school. He went to his boss and said, I have a great idea. Can we consolidate all these four lines around here and do Alameda Corridor? That line opened in 2005. So it took only about uh, 26 years for it. And that's supposed to be simple, consolidating four real lines and making them work. So this is just this an idea of how difficult it is to plan for a region with so many stakeholders, but you know, that it goes through about 18 different cities, and every city has to be heard, and every city has conditions, and you know, they work through it. So started as a planning idea, it's built, I'm glad it's built, it would be a disaster if it's not, with all kinds of reasons. The question I think is, what about Alameda Corridor East going eastward? And that's a good question. Right now, there is an organization called Alameda Corridor East that built the great crossings to, to kind of enhance the, the, the train movement going east. And, and this great crossing is, is a good, minimizes the community impact, decreases the delay for passengers instead of sitting there waiting for a mile long train to pass. But the problem with that, it doesn't increase capacity. It doesn't give you any added capacity to the rail. It's a very good strategy, and I mean the corridor should be extended east, but still would not deal with the capacity issues that we need. Yes? Um, last year in our class, we heard of one of the, uh, con one of the con scouts, con con contractors, excuse me, InfraConsult was working on the 710 yeah. project, talking about a, a physical enclosure, and I've heard also that there has been some discussion of undergrounding around Pasadena um, to resolve longstanding issues. I mean, what is sort of the status of those? mitigation projects? Well, so the, the, the 710, the this one is the, called the 710 South, from here to the 60. I think you're talking about the 710 that goes, the tunnel that mm -hmm. goes to Pasadena. That tunnel has nothing to do with goods movement. Actually, trucks are not allowed in that tunnel. Uh, so that's a different discussion. And the 710 has been in the planning for 50 some years. Uh, we're probably going to do it, I don't know. It's some proposal to do a tunnel, six six point two mile tunnel, two tunnels actually, for two ways. Uh, I think it's in a very late stage in planning. Metro uh, Major R has seven hundred million dollars to be used for that. This is a very good example of public private. But the the track that we're talking about is from the ports to the sixty, and doesn't necessarily have to do with the, with the south and southern portion. Yes, sir. 
Yes, you mentioned uh, San Diego act actually trying to discourage a, a certain class of shipments. Do you see uh, a conflict of interest between sort of local concerns and broader state and regional or national concerns? And sure. like, how might that, that be resolved? Sure, and there is definitely uh, competition. I mean, obviously, every region, I tease my, my colleague in San Diego that, you know, you need, you need to be more regional, you know, you need to think global. Um, obviously, when it comes to local politics, you know, this is very strong. I mean, there is competition. I would say for the state of California, <coughs> goods movement in Southern California is so important to the state economy that the state should invest in this. This is important for the nation, that the national government should invest in this. I mean, 43% of the total goods coming to the U.S. from Asia is through these ports. And so if I were to be advising the DOT secretary, I would say, you need a national policy in trade because it's important for the country. But uh, unfortunately, the way it works is like this. There's 50 states, there's two senators per state, and therefore in California, two senators go and says, well, this is important for the nation, which they're right. They said, yeah, right. Uh, they, they would never, they never buy them. But the reason that there is no national money in the transportation bill is just that. Because nobody has sympathy for California, first of all. And second of all, every state could argue that what I do is important to the country also. Uh, there's uh, farming, etc. So yeah, there is that competition. But as a nation, we need to pay attention to, to the global thinking of what's important for the country. Yes, sir. Uh, to what extent do you foresee uh, intelligent transportation systems and information technology improving goods movement? Uh, huge. Uh, it has, and it, it hasn't 100 percent utilized. But the intelligent transportation system use is huge. I mean, simple things like I think like signal signalization. Many of us says, well, the technology exists, and when you talk to the city of Los Angeles, says, oh, my 70 percent of my lights are. But actually, it's pretty bad. It's like region-wide, it's about 53% of signal are signalized. And one would argue you that if you do that at a larger scale, you added capacity right there. So intelligent transportation system is going to be huge and it's going to be part of the solution. And it could be actually the, the reason why we're going to we're going to be OK in terms of congestion without building a lot of highways. But unfortunately, we're not. We're not utilizing everything we have today. Uh, and and that, that goes for the port too. Yes? So these are basically electrical parts? Electric or, or near zero, or, or clean, uh, clean gas. So I was wondering, is there enough energy uh, or Very good question. in the grid, or is this system, does this system need to be supplied by a different that's an excellent question. Even even that question goes to passenger cars. Do we have enough? Does Edison have enough energy to supply a million cars today, electric cars today? And of course, if you talk to Edison, they'll tell you we have enough energy to supply as much as you want, but you need to tell us how much you want, and you need to pay for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, they just closed the. <laughs> yeah, they just closed the San Humphrey. How many of you heard of that closure? Yeah, this is important. You know, the San Humphrey generate twenty percent of total energy for Southern California. How many of you felt the impact of twenty percent is not there? Not many. Uh, obviously, there is there is a lot all kinds of things about why that is, and they're debating now whether the. They open it, they open it in stages, etc., etc. I think the energy, uh, how you generate energy is important. Right now in California, a lot of energy are generated outside California. And that gets into the air quality impact. But obviously, the, the other state that generates mix is going to wake up one day and says, why the hell are we bearing the emission impact of generating electricity for California? So we need to deal with that issue. I believe that if we decide to do it, yes, we'll figure out an energy source, a cleaner energy source to fuel trucks and passenger vehicles. But that's important because the infrastructure is not there right now to have 2 million electric passenger vehicles. Where are you going to charge them? Is every parking has a charge? Is your homes equipped? As a matter of fact, you can't just go now to your homes if it's built in the 1980s, 1760s, and just plug in <coughs> your car. You can't do that. 
your power, you have to do a three to four thousand dollar improvement to that. So the first thing we need to start with, and this is we're dealing with with the sustainable community strategy, is require developers for new houses to equip the houses with charging, the ability to charge the gas. Is very good question. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, you said that in a certain country they were able to capture out of the land value right. the lifetime maintenance of the project. What, where was that? In Hong Kong, oh. Singapore, um, Shanghai, in, in China. Uh, there's uh, these are examples of where you know if you go to Hong Kong, it's the most expensive real estate. You don't need a car to, to feel good in, in Hong Kong. And, and the infrastructure will maintain, will continue because they were able to capture land value. And here, we're still experimenting with, uh, for example, you know, we're trying to encourage transit oriented development. You know what that is, right? So, right now, we're building rail in a significant way. I mean, in 1990, we had no rail, and all of a sudden, we're having some rail. And say in the exposition line they're trying to develop around stations. Now a very simple idea that they do in Hong Kong, you sell the rights going up if you're an entity that operates the line. You tell, you tell a private developer, you can go up as high as you want. In return, I want you to pay for this and that and that and that. That's how you finance big infrastructure and you pay for it in a normal. I think we're just beginning to experiment with that. And we need to do more of that selling the rights to go up for financing infrastructure. So Hong Kong, and, and one will tell you that their model uh, is working very well. There's other places where it's not working. In Mumbai, India, you don't see a lot of high rises. And, and one of the reasons is they actually think it's morally wrong to build high rises. So they have to overcome that cultural thing. And that's one of the places where it's not so successful. So we, we have a lot to learn of how to use land and the proceeds from land to finance infrastructure because continuing dependence on gasoline taxes that are dwindling and that are indexed with time is not going to be the way to the future. Any other question? Yes? Can you give us any indication of the trade-off between congestion and fees? Like how much are truck drivers and truck companies willing to pay to save a day, an hour? That's a very good question. So, depend where you're going. So if you're here and you need to make a trip at 7 o'clock to Victorville, somewhere here on the 15th, Victorville is in San Bernardino County. That's about 130 miles trip. If you leave anywhere between 5 and 10, that trip could take you about 3 to 4 hours if you're a truck. If if you have that facility, you could do that in one hour and a half. So is the, the, the one hour and a half saving worth it for you, giving what you're shipping? Uh, I mean, some people would argue that I could do two trips for the price of one, so I might end up. So it depends where you're going. Mm -hmm. If you're going a short distance, say if you're going from the port to Wilmington, probably not a good idea to use uh, the facility. But it depends. But if you're going from here to industry, in certain, yes. Now, the prices have to be congestion based. Mm -hmm. It's like the 91 toll road. Mm -hmm. If you use it at the highest, you pay 10 dollars, sometimes you pay 30 cents. Yes? No. Um, so, will these be mileage based toll roads? Yes. Then? Yes. And I, I would hope, I mean, we, this is something Professor Taylor helped us with. In this region of transportation, we propose that we go away from the gasoline tax to mileage based because that's more user. Politically, that's not so easy or so popular. Yes, no. uh, are any of those fees expected to be passed on to the consumers? Of course. Every fee is. Of course. I don't know if they're going to make enough money in terms of saving time. No, it yeah. will be passed one way or another to you and I when we go to Walmart. But you know, we're spoiled. I mean, we, let me tell you, one would tell you that if, if, if you're living on Cleveland, Ohio, and you're buying a Sony TV, a big Sony TV, there is 50% chance that it came to the port of Angeles. So if you pay $2,000 for that, what if you pay $2,005 and $5 came to improve the infrastructure? One would argue that. The problem with that argument is politically it's so unpopular to talk about taxes because politicians are just, just don't want to talk about taxes. It doesn't matter what they need to do. 
But I believe there is ways to finance infrastructure with a fee that's not felt. A container that comes to the port, average value is about $35,000. So charge a couple of cents. That's 0 0.000 forever percent. <laughs> Nobody's going to feel it. But politically, it's hard to, to do it. I, I think it is, mathematically, it's possible to collect enough money to build infrastructure and maintain it. Politically, it's hard to say. Yes, so just to, to pick up on that, it, it, it seems to me that um, in the studies of the uh, of the container fees uh, and, and uh, the elasticity response of, of shippers to them, uh, part of it is that uh, one of the purposes of the fees is to collect money to um, internalize a lot of the environmental externalities, so to develop cleaner truck programs, yeah. to reduce particulate matter, to deal with noise and the traffic impacts. And another is to address another set of externalities related to the delay. So uh, part of it is is that um, that you have a system now where uh, the uh, the problems of, of pollution and, and accidents are disproportionately borne by people who live and work along the corridors. But on the other hand, the delay it seems to me um, runs higher costs through the whole length of the system. And there's long delays in getting through LA. So to some extent, I would think that the elasticity of, of response on the part of shippers. I could understand that they'd say, oh, well, there's a limit. I can ship my dirty stuff through Seattle, and they won't charge me for it, and I'm willing to do that. But on the other hand, if some of those fees are paid off in terms of far less delay, I think I'm picking up on the last comment, that uh, it seems to me there'd be a different sort of response, because their total cost of moving through the, the, the Southern California, because if you think about getting from Hong Kong to, to Cleveland, if there's a big bottleneck in, in yeah. LA, and they're able to use some of that fee to reduce it, there may be some trade offs that might be less sensitive to that fee than just for externalizing those environmental experiments. No question. I, I think one of the reasons the container fee bill was not signed is exactly that. Congestion pricing works well because if you value time and you can save time, and you know, in any congestion facility, you could guarantee certain speed. You could say, I'm going to stop taking trucks when I reach 45 miles per hour. You could do that. But like Brian said, when you do a container fee at the port, you're also paying for mitigation. And, and that's where shippers are going to say, wait a minute, I could do, go do it cheaper. Uh, I think a, a good congestion pricing fee could do both if, if you do it right. Uh, I, I don't think it's the, the best ways to charge it at the port because, again, that has implication, you know, other ports don't charge, etc. But there is ways to charge it so that uh, it is charged nationally, so that the argument if I can go somewhere else is, is not there. The problem with national charging, which we as an agency oppose bills in Washington that say let us charge nationally, is the problem is we're going to collect 40% of the fee and get 10% back. Right. And that's not good. Uh, so there is, the, you know, there is, but, but the point here is somebody has to pay for this, and eventually the consumer is going to pay it. But well, we have to just come to a realization without paying, we cannot go anywhere. And then one more question. We have time for one more question. So just with regard to the pilot study yeah. for the corridor, I'm wondering about the scope and scale of that project and if you think it will prove the true capabilities of the system, if it's going to be at a smaller scale. Uh, this is it's going to start with a $35 million grant supplied mainly by South Coast Air Quality Management District and our grants uh, through the application. I think we will be able to definitely talk about whether the technology is there or not, whether the scale of the demonstration is large enough to apply to the 110 miles, I'm not sure. But I think the demonstration will demonstrate whether the technology works uh, within, within so many miles. I think it's... I would be very happy if we could do it, because frankly, this should stop the debate about whether technology is there. Okay, let's thank Mr. Pratt.